If you have your copy of God's word, we're turning to Jeremiah 29 today. Jeremiah 29, we'll look at verse 11 a few, but I really want us to look at the verses around Jeremiah 29, 11. That's a verse that's been on a lot of t-shirts. It's been thrown around a lot. It's a powerful verse, but I want us to see the context of that so we understand. It's not a health and wealth that says if we just, you know, God's just going to bless us with all kinds of good stuff. That's not what he's talking about there. So we'll kind of look at the background of the text. But if you have that in your copy of God's word, Jeremiah 29, give you a chance to find that. And if you would, in honor of reading God's word, would you stand with me as we spend some time in God's word this morning? Jeremiah 29, verses 1 through 14. And the prophet writes, he says, Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconia and the queen mother of the court offices, officials, the princes of Judah, Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by hand from Elsiah, the son of Shaphan, and Jemariah, of Hil- son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem, Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there, multiply there and do not decrease." Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when the 70 years have been completed for Babylon, and I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and come to pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord God, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place where I sent you into exile, from where I sent you into exile. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of the prophet as he speaks to us today. I pray, Father, that you use me to faithfully communicate your word to each of us, your people today, that your spirit might have sway in our hearts and remind us of who you are and what you're desiring to do in each and every one of our lives. Father, you know every situation, every heart here, and I pray, Father, you speak to each of us as you desire. Use us for your purposes that we might bring you glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty. Well, there's a lot here that we could talk about, but we'll focus on some things in, the, in this passage. You know, there are, there are times in life that are challenging for us, aren't there? Times when we're looking around and we're wondering, okay, God, I know this is going on. Where are you in the midst of this and what is the purpose for it? Have you ever had one of those days or those times and seasons in life where you wonder, really, where am I going? Is there a point to this? And I'm sure that if you can imagine, if you will with me for a minute, what it was like. The the exile is one of those things that's really hard for us to grasp. You know, can you imagine, and this happened not to all the Israelites, but to those who were in leadership, those who were educated, those who had resources, were pulled out of Israel, out of Jerusalem, and placed in Babylon. In a place where they did not speak the language, in a place where they did not understand the culture, They had strange food, strange ideas, and they had been taken from everything they know, their home and everything, and were separated. Many of them left their families behind, their grandchildren. Now, many of you you are probably separated from your grandchildren. You hate that. I know my mom reminds me. In fact, I talked to her just yesterday, and she reminded me how much she misses us and how she'd like to see her granddaughters, you know, hint, hint. And, uh, you know, that's just hard. And And it's, you know, you can travel in our country pretty easily, but when you're in exile, you don't have opportunity to go back. You can imagine what those goodbyes were like and how hard that was for many of these folks going that they were going to go away and the prophet told them it would be 70 years. Now, I'm not a great mathematician, but I'm going to guess that pretty much most of the people that went away to exile were never coming back after 70 years. Would you agree? That's a long time. 70 years is pretty much what most of us expect to live, or maybe hopefully longer, but that's kind of the And if you're already a little ways down the road, as I am, that 70 years from now, I really don't anticipate I will be around. It's really a very slim chance that I will still be in this, be alive, really slim. And some of the rest of you are with me on that, and some of you are even ahead of me. But anyway, 
That's what they were told. So there's all that despair and hopelessness. They're leaving everything they know. They're moving away. They're leaving everyone they love and they're going to this strange land called Babylon. And they're wondering why? What's this about? And Jeremiah is the prophet. We call him the weeping prophet for a lot of reasons because he's given the responsibility to share with them the truth of God's word, to share with them why they're going and to give them a hard message that they probably didn't want to hear. The Babylonian captivity, what they were experiencing was all part of God's judgment upon the nation for their sin and their rebellion. They had rejected God's standards. They had rejected everything God had done for them. They had you know, decided to do it their own way. They didn't care what God thought and God punished the nation. And that was part of that punishment. It's prophesied in the scripture. It's throughout, it's a reminder of what's gonna take place. And so for 70 years, these people are gonna be separated from everything they know. And out of all that comes this text. And, and Jeremiah says a lot of things in the passage here. I want us to kind of hone in on some of the verses. Go ahead and look again, if you would, with me uh, as we look in chapter 29 and verses four and following. He tells them how to approach life because, you know, when you think about going away and you think about leaving everything you know, you think, well, what am I going to do? Just moan about what I've lost? And he says, don't do that. This is what God tells him to do. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts. When that says that, folks, that means we listen. Because the Lord is saying this to the children of Israel, to those who are in exile, he says, the God of Israel, to all the exiles, he wants to remind them, for whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is who I'm talking to. Do this. Verse five, build houses, live in them. Plant gardens, eat the produce, take wives and become fathers of sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will have welfare. In other words, live your life. Live where you are, bloom where you're planted. That's that favorite slogan that we all hate to hear, right? Because sometimes it's always better somewhere else. But he is telling them, go where you are, where I have placed you, live your life, do what all the things you're supposed to do and seek and pray for the welfare of this city. Pray for Babylon, pray that I would bless them, pray for God's mercy upon them. Because as I bless them, I bless you. I mean, it would be kind of silly to go somewhere and say, I don't want to be there, so I'm going to pray that God would curse them, wouldn't it? If you're there, is that not a good, bad plan? What do you think? You know, you can imagine wherever God might send you. I don't know where that would be that would terrify you, but you say, well, God, bring judgment on them. Well, if you're there, wait a minute, that's not really what you want, is it? You want God to be good. And he's trying to remind them of this important truth. And it's a truth that we struggle with because a lot of times in my life and maybe in some of yours, we're looking for the next thing. We're looking for what we can do that we feel we can be better or use more. And you know, you talk about that in your profession, right? In your job, you try and advance to this point and that point and get to a point to where you feel you finally arrived maybe. And he's telling you to live your life now and to honor him in this place where I put you. And he let them know why they were there. Did you see what he said? In the place where I have put you into exile. I put you here. Don't blame it on the Babylonians. Don't blame it on your circumstances. Don't blame it on anything, but blame it on me, God says. I put you there. Now, be a blessing. Live your life. And there may be times in our culture, in our world today, that we sometimes feel as Christians, we're a little bit on the outside looking in maybe. Would you say that? Some things have happened. It's a little different world than the world that many of us grew up in. I mean, I've been around for a little over 50 years and it was different in the 70s and 80s than it is today. Would you agree with that? And not just the hairstyles. It's different. It's a different way of life, different perspectives. There are people that see things differently now than they did then. And rather than bemoan that and protest that and focus on that, that's really, I don't think, the heart of who we are to be as the people of God. I think our focus is to be upon our creator and realize we are here, this is where we are, this is what we're, where we're called to be, and we're called to serve in the middle of this. That's why the song that was sang a while ago hopefully resonated with you. It's not about people knowing who we are. It's not about the legacy that we live. It's about making the name of Jesus known and bringing glory and honor to him with our lives. That's what our lives are all about. This life that you and I live is not about us. This church is not about the people that go here. Okay? It's about Jesus. When it becomes about us, we've lost sight of why we're here. Does that make sense? And the same is true in our own lives. And we've experienced that. Whenever my life becomes about what I need to get done and what I want to happen and my, you know, whatever, I lose sight of why I'm on this planet. And I'm on this planet 
to bring others to Christ, to demonstrate his glory and to, bring, to make his name great. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here as a Christian. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's what your life is all about. It's, the other stuff's nice. The other stuff has its place. But it's not about that. It's about him. And Jeremiah, in the same sense, is trying to help the children of Israel understand it's not about you. It's not about where you're at. It's not about your circumstances that you moan and complain about because you know they were complaining, right? Because we do that as people, don't we? Whenever things don't go our way, what do we do? We complain. We whine. We moan. It's what we do. It's human nature, I guess, one of our fallen traits that we have. We struggle with that. And it's just interesting. We always do it. And we see it laid out again in Scripture, but here he's reminding them, that's not what your life is about. Live your life. Go about doing what you're supposed to do. Bless the place where you have been and understand that you are there for a season. You're going to be there for 70 years. Suck it up, buddy, and live your life. Quit whining and live your life. You're there because I put you there. And you know why I put you there. It's kind of like a parent, isn't he here? And God kind of just kind of laying it out like a dad and just saying, okay, kiddos, this is why you're there. This is what's happened. Get over it. And then he has that incredible promise. Did you see what he said there? It starts really in verse 10. I know we talk about verse 11 and verse 11 has probably been on more t-shirts than maybe only John 3, 16's got it beat, I think, on the number of t-shirts that I've seen for Jeremiah 20, 11. It's everywhere. And Henry Blackaby and Experiencing God, that's pretty much what that entire study is built around this text. And he really lays it out far better than I ever could, but he talks about the plan that God has for you. And notice it's in the context of difficulty and suffering and being where you don't want to be. That's the context of that verse. This is not a health and wealth verse. This is not a promise that you're going to have a lot of stuff. This is knowing God knows better than you and I know what's best for us. Sometimes I don't like hearing that. Maybe you do. But there are times in my life that I, I, I struggle with that. But I love what he says here. When the 70 years are done, when it's all over and it's completed, then I will visit you. And I will fulfill my good word to you and I will bring you back home to this place. Why? Because I know the plans that I have for you. Declares the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. And he has a plan and a purpose for South End Baptist Church, does he not? There's a reason why we're here. There's a purpose. There's a reason why we come together, right? A hope. I hope you don't just come together because, well, you know, there wasn't anything else to do. I think I'll do this today. You know, a lot of times in life, we begin to think that that's why we do what we do. We do the things that we do because, well, you know, it's what I want to do. But what we don't understand is that God is actually sovereign, okay? God is in control. Even when it doesn't look like it, and even when you don't think so, he is in control. And he has a purpose and a direction and a plan for every one of our lives. And as we surrender to him, he will accomplish that. And sometimes, even when we don't surrender and we push our way, he still gets his way, doesn't he? Now, I don't know how you are, but there have been times in my life when I've tried to tell God, well, God, that's a great plan, but you don't understand. Do you realize how stupid that sounds when I say that? You may not think it's stupid when you say it, but when I say it, it's really stupid. Because what about my life does the king of the universe, the creator of all, the ancient of days, the one who has always been and always will be, not understand about my life? What does he not understand? What have I done that has not through all these years of human history and all these people that have been on the planet and will be on the planet, has he not seen a thousand times over? Really? I'm going to tell God something God doesn't know. But we think that sometimes, don't we? We don't say it out loud, but in our hearts, in our minds, that's what we're saying. Well, God, I know you have these plans for me, but I think it would be better if we do this. And he's saying, child, it's not about your plans. It's about mine. It's like when we pray to God. You know, when you ask God, God will, you will, God will answer your prayer in one of three ways, right? He'll say yes. He'll say no. And he'll say the one that I hate the most, and maybe some of you do as well, wait. Don't you love to wait? How many of you love waiting? How many of you love sitting in line at that fast food, misnamed fast food restaurant with 12 other cars, and there you are. You're waiting. And you're waiting. Or you go to the doctor's office, and the appointment was at 10, and it's 11.45, and you are doing what? You are waiting. 
How many of you enjoy that? None of us. We go in the, we're heading down, down towards D.C. or Baltimore. We're on the wonderful mess that are our highways around here just because there's just so many people, right? And you're in traffic and everybody's sitting there. I know the speed limit says 60, but no, you're not even doing six. So, I mean, what are you doing? You're waiting. And waiting seems like such a waste of time, doesn't it? When you were a child, there were probably things that your parents, you wanted to do. And what would your mom or dad say? You got to wait. I don't want to wait. I want it now. And I'm sure the children of Israel that were in exile, wanting to go back home, really tired of that Babylonian cuisine and really tired of hearing people talk in a language they didn't understand and all the different things that were going on being in a foreign culture. I'm sure they were saying, we really want out of here. We want to go home. And what does God say? Wait. Wait. And maybe sometimes in your life and mine, he says the same thing. That's right. He's telling us. He's saying, okay, wait. It hasn't unfolded yet. Because you see, God's got, you know, I think he knows a little bit more about life than you and I do. Would you agree with that? I think he understands what's going on. I mean, it's hard for me to really, I, I can't fathom it. I try and it just, it just messes with my mind and it just kind of turns into mush. When I think that the creator of the universe knows what's going on in everybody's life on this planet, whether they're his or not, he knows. Now that's not even talking about the, was it Carl Sagan says billions and billions of stars, that he's got all that going around, right? That's orchestrating so it doesn't all collapse in on itself and we don't all just implode and turn into jelly or whatever. I, it, he's got that. But he knows everything about your life and he's working on all these different things, but yet he's able to do that in such a mystifying and beautiful way because of who he is. He's different from everybody else. He's like us, but not really. He's like us in some of the character traits. We get them from him. We didn't, he didn't get them from us. We get them from him. But he's also beyond us because he is God. He is the Holy One. He is the Mighty One. And I want us to camp out in the next two verses because I think the next two verses really bring us a lot of hope. After he talks about that, he says in verse 12, he says, then you will call on me. After, all, after he's brought him back and all the good things, he says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. When I was growing up, my mother would say, are you listening, boy? Or are you just hearing? Okay, guys, I'm going to pick on you for a little bit this morning, men. Maybe this has only happened to me. Have you ever been accused, gentlemen, of not listening? Yeah, okay, there's several of us. Last service, it was just Rich and I. I don't know why, but everybody else was good, but we were the only two. But, you know, there have been those times, huh? Uh, you better, yeah, you better, Ray, you know. <laughs> but you listen. You know, and there's a difference between hearing and listening. Listening is active. Listen is focused. But think about this. We mentioned a while ago all the billions of people on planet Earth that are crying out to God, and he's able to zone in on every single one of them, including you, and listen. He doesn't just hear it out there. I'll catch that one. He's focused. He's listening to you. That's the kind of attention he gives us as his children. Does that mess with anybody else's mind? I mean, we're talking God here. We're talking the Creator. We're talking the Almighty takes time out of his schedule, which I'm sure is very busy. You know, he's got a few things to do and listens to us. And he reminds the children of Israel here, I will listen to you. I will listen. And then 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. There's a lot there. I mean, there's sermons, sermons in these two verses, a lot. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. When you seek after the Lord with all your heart, you will find him. He's not going to play hide and seek and, oh, I'm hidden over here, can't find me. He's wanting you to look for him. And when you, when you say, okay, God, you and nothing else, I'm going to find you. Where are, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is God's not the one who's lost. We're the ones wandering around and not knowing where we're at, right? And so we get lost and consumed by everything else and all the things that we think in our minds, all the things that we think are so important, all the things that matter so much to us, we think that matters. And God's like, anytime, buddy, I'm right here. Come on home, son. 
daughter, come on, right here. And he wanted the children of Israel to hear this, and I think he wants us to be reminded of this as well. That in the middle of life, in the middle of the stuff, in the middle of things that we go on, whether it's good, bad, or whatever, he is there. Does that comfort anyone else? You cannot go anywhere, and he's not with you as a child of God. You may think he's not there, and it may feel like he's not there, and you may think it's the worst thing you've ever experienced, and it may be a horrible thing, and a lot of us go through a lot of horrible stuff. That is, not, that is reality, isn't it? Life is full of a lot of messes and things that really make us question a lot of things about ourselves, but God is with us in the middle of that. And when we seek after him, we find him. Our eyes are open, and we begin to see him and understand who he is, and he speaks to us in the middle of those situations. And many of you have been in those situations in your life, much like the nation of Israel was in that situation where they were despairing and not, you know, imagine you're told and you know when you say goodbye to your kids and your grandkids that you will never, ever see them again. No visits back on holidays. You're going into exile, going to be there 70 years. You're not going to see them again. And you know that. And yet you're reminded by God in the middle of this, I am with you. Sometimes we think God is only with us in the good times when it's going well and everything's like a, I don't know. I'm going to date myself. Anybody remember the Archies? You know, Archie songs are always happy, right? Just happy. Or the monkeys. There's another group. Anybody remember the monkeys? Yeah. I mean, the always happy songs. Yeah. But life's not like that, is it? Sometimes life is hard. Sometimes things happen that we don't understand. Sometimes things happen that we don't like. Sometimes things happen that frustrate us, that make us angry. And we want to shake our fist at God and say, why is this happening to me? We really don't want an answer when we say that. You know it. <laughs> we don't want, we think we do, but we really don't want the answer. And yet in the middle of that circumstance, there he is. Okay, child, I'm with you. I got this. Let's go. Together, let's go. I'll walk with you through this. It's going to be painful. It's going to be hard, but we're going to go through it together. You know, the last thing Jesus said before he left was what? And lo, I'm with you always. The good times, the bad times, the boring times, all times, I'm with you. I'm there. All you got to do is call. I'm there. I'm right there. I'm with you. I'm in. I'm in. It's, that's what Emmanuel means, the idea of God with us. He is ever present with us. He is always there no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, no matter how despairing or frustrated we may get. The God of the universe is right there in the middle of it. But sometimes to really experience all that he has for us, really understand what he's doing, we have to wait. We have to say, okay, God, all right, I'll trust your timing. Because God's timing is different than your timing and my timing, isn't it? You know that. You've been there. You know, we, we, like, we, we, we have such a fast food mentality in our minds. We have been spoiled, haven't we? We think everything should happen, boom, you know? It's like, I, I, you know, sitcoms are crazy. They solve the world's problems in whatever. The number keeps getting smaller. It used to be 22 minutes. I think it's down to 19. I don't know, because they, they got so many commercials, you don't have, it's not hardly there, but they, because they got to have that, you know, three-minute intro song, and they got to have, you know, they solve all their problems. It always, but does life work out that way? No. It's television, folks. They write it. It's, pre, it's predetermined by somebody out with a pen or I guess a typewriter or a computer now. It's not a typewriter. Can be, nobody uses typewriters anymore. Computer. They've got it all figured out and they've got it all planned out and that's how it's going to work and it's supposed to make you feel better about yourself, really. But life does not work that way. God's timing is so different than that because God's timing is based on his agenda. His purposes, his plan for your life. And he sees it not just in light of our surroundings and our surroundings, but in light of how it lays out with all the kingdom of God and all the believers in Jesus, how it all folds together and all the different places that you will find yourself and all the individuals you will encounter, some you don't even know yet. And those lives, how they're going to intertwine with yours. And it's like a big gooey mess. And yet to God, it's a symphony. He sees how it's all going to work together because he knows that. 
And he seeks to guide you on that path because he has a plan for your life, a purpose for your life. And that purpose is to exalt his name and to bring him glory and to accomplish more in and through your life than you ever dream possible for the sake of the kingdom of God. That's what it's all about. You're not a cosmic accident. You are designed for a purpose by a creator who loves you. Now, I know there are days it doesn't feel like it. Anybody had those days? Oh, yeah. Maybe it was today. Maybe it was yesterday. Usually it's not Friday. It's usually Mondays. That's usually the day, right? When it goes that way. But our Savior reminds us here as he speaks to the prophet that I am with you. Seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's the focus, really the focus of this text, the focus of the entire book of Jeremiah to help them understand that. Because there are times in our lives when it doesn't seem to work the way I want it to. And God says, that's okay. It's not about you, Michael. It's really not. And one of the hardest things for me to get through and get over and I still struggle with it. I'm like, I'm not, I haven't arrived. If you think that I think I've arrived in my faith, then you've misheard me, and I've never. The only time I'll have arrived is when I'm before him, standing completed in perfection as he has made me to be. That's it. Until then, I'm still a work in progress, and so are you, and that's okay. But what a, progr- what a, you know, what a, what a process he does in us when you think about it. Think about where you were and now where you are and how God has used different things in your life and how God continues to do that in your life and continues to move you in that perspective. And he's trying to help you understand some things, not fully, but as best you can. Because if God gave you the whole enchilada at once, you'd be lost, wouldn't you? Could you imagine, I love it, with God, tell me what you're doing. Show me. Could you imagine what it would look like if God tried to show you how your life intertwined with your family, your friends, your encounters, the people on the other side of the planet that you're not going to meet, but your, your, your life is going to have an is gonna have a impact on them? If how all that worked together, if you imagine God tried to show you that in about three minutes, what that would do to your brain? There's no way we could handle it. We didn't understand it. It would we wouldn't, it'd be like, ugh, it'd be like, I don't know. Think of the most confusing thing you've ever seen. Trying to study physics, our daughter's doing that. I don't understand that. It's like, whatever. I'm lost. It'd be worse than that. And yet, what I love, there's a lot of things I love about my Savior and my Creator, but I'm so grateful that He's patient with me. Aren't you? He's like, you know, Mike, because really, if the truth were told, there have been a lot of days I should be about... I should be dust. He should just wipe me out. I mean, I'm done with you, boy. That's it. I've had enough. And yet, he shows me mercy, and he's patient, and he's forgiving. He's like, okay, we're going to walk with you on this. Let me help you understand it. And I'm grateful for that. And sometimes, though, I'd never admit it, except now I will. There are times I'm glad he says, wait. Because there are times we're not ready for what he wants to do in us yet. We have some growing to do. We have some things he needs to accomplish in our lives. We have other situations that are a part of the situation that we're in that we don't even realize it. And he's working on that in the middle of that. And he's trying to get everything worked together so that the timing is just right to do what he's desiring to do. And we can't, we're, we're in the middle of the muck and we don't know what's going on. And it frustrates us. But you know, if anybody knows what it's like to be in the middle of the muck, it's Jeremiah, isn't it? Remember what happened to Jeremiah? He was faithful to God. He did everything God wanted him to do. He was telling them the word of God. And what did they do to Jeremiah? They stuck him in a cistern. You know what a cistern is. You don't want to be in the bottom of a cistern. That's a nasty place. I mean, I don't even think, it, it probably wouldn't be appropriate to really talk about what that place is here and, you know, this kind of gathering. It was just so bad. It's just one of the worst places. And here's Jeremiah at the bottom of it. And he'd been there for a while. They forgot he was there. He was there so long. They forgot about him until, oh, wait a minute. Remember Jeremiah? We stuck him in that cistern. We probably ought to get him out, you know. Well, I'm sure you ought to. And they lowered him down, pulled him out. I, I can't imagine what he was going through every day, experience. That's got to be worse than being in the belly of a fish. I'm just telling you, it's got to be. That's bad. And there he is. And yet, we don't know. Of course, Jeremiah wrote the book, but we don't, he didn't complain. He didn't gripe. I'm sure he felt bad. I'm sure he had days with God. He was like, God, when am I getting out of here? And if the time was right, they brought him out. 
And maybe you're in that same mess right now. I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I don't see you into your life. But I know in a group like this, there's folks that are probably going through some things that they don't want to be going through right now. It's pretty common, isn't it? But you know, while I don't know, God knows. While I don't fully understand what you're going through, God does. And I can't walk with you in that. I'm not omnipresent. No, not even close. God is. He is omnipresent. He is the only one that is omnipresent. You know, Satan isn't omnipresent, though you think he is sometimes. He's not. I don't care what Flip Wilson says. He doesn't make you do everything, and he's not, yeah, I, you know who Flip Wilson is? Some of you are like, who's Flip Wilson? You can look him up, you to him. All right. Yeah, some of you might a little bit, oh, you know who I'm talking about. He, the devil made me do it. That's what he always said, but no, not really. The devil, didn't have, the devil doesn't have to help me do a lot of bad things. We're most pretty good at that ourselves by now. But the reality is, is that God is with you everywhere. Everywhere. What if we began to grasp that in our mind as best we could? That wherever I go, whatever I do, whomever I'm with, the king of the universe is right there with me. That changed maybe the way we do things? No, it would for me. I mean, if he were there in bodily form, Boy, that would be an eye-opener, wouldn't it? It'd be tough. It'd be good for me. But he's better than being in there in bodily form. He's there in spirit. He's always there. And he's walking with us. And he reminds us, I am with you. There I am. Child, why do you get so worried? Why do you get so anxious? Why do you get so focused on how things are gonna, you know, and we do that, don't we? We get, it's not gonna work. And we get all these Worst case scenarios in our head and we start thinking, oh, it's gonna happen this way. It's all gonna fall, all this blah, blah, blah. And we've got it all worded out. We, in our culture, we're hilarious as Christians. We're hilarious. We are so naive. And I'm gonna meddle a little bit. Is that okay? Doesn't matter. I, I got the mic, so I'm gonna do it anyway. There's a lot of things wrong with the American culture right now. Amen? There's a lot of things. We have stepped away from who we are supposed to be. Absolutely. We have lost that. Now, we can complain about it and we can protest about it and that's nice and good, but that's not what we're told to do. You know what we're told to do? We're to pray. We're to seek to pray. Just like they were. Bless them. We're to pray. We're to get on our knees before God and pray and deal and let God deal with it. You know, when you have battles in your life and you have challenges and you have things you like people, does anybody have people drive you crazy? And I'm not talking about your in-laws, okay? That was a joke, all right? Pray. Pray for God to have his way. Don't connive. Don't scheme. We do that so well. Think that's going to accomplish something. It doesn't mean anything. What matters most is what God wants to accomplish with your life. Does that make sense? That's what he's trying to help them understand. Folks, it's not about what you want. It's not about what's best for you. What is all about is what I desire to accomplish in and through this life that I have given you. Because he is the king of the universe and you and I are not. He is the Lord of glory. He is the creator of all. He is the one who has the plan. He knows what he's doing. He's in charge. He knows the plans he has for us. And he asks us to trust him and let that play out in whatever way he wants it to play out. Now, there's one more verse in here I want to just touch base on as we finish. And verse 14 is kind of long, but it's a powerful promise. It's a prophecy. You see what it is? Because they're going to be in exile, but they're going to be in more than exile in a few years. And this is the promise that the nation, the many Jews hung on to for many, many years is in this verse. And you all, it says in verse 14, I, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have what? Where I have driven you. Did you hear? Did you catch that? God's the one that drove them away. He's the one that removed them from their place out of judgment. I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. I will bring you back to Jerusalem. I will bring you back. That's a promise of what happened in 1948 when Israel became a nation again. After the Roman 
Romans came in and they basically destroyed Jerusalem and scattered the Jews. The Jews were not a country for almost nine, over almost 1900 years, did not exist. They were a people, there were Jews all over the world. They were scattered to the, every nation. And then in 1948, some miracle happened. You know the miracle, right? They started the nation of Israel. Put it right, and we've been fighting about this ever since 1948, haven't we? That's what all, a lot of our mess is about. Polit politically, people get all, the Palestinian, it's a whole mess. But God said that was gonna happen. And that's, there it is. If you say, well, what about Bible prophecy? Well, there's one for you right there, folks. I will gather you from all the nations where I've scattered you. That was his promise. And maybe we feel a little scattered sometimes as followers of Jesus Christ, don't we? Feel a little disconnected from where God has placed us and where we want to be. We think, God, it's, you know, it's just not the way it's supposed to be in, in the United States of America. No, it's not. Is God still Lord Overall, when things are going wonderful in your life and everything's going according to plan, is God Lord? Absolutely. When things stink and it's the worst day of your life and you think nothing could get any worse than this and you are having a horrible day, month, year, whatever, is God still God? Has he stepped off his throne for a minute and said, I'm not in charge anymore, we'll see what, what happens. Does chaos ever reign because God's not in control? No. Sometimes God lets chaos have its way for a while, lets crazy things happen, lets stupid people in charge. He does that. God does that. But ultimately, he is always the one that is in control. Always. And so what do you and I do with that? We say, well, Lord, we complain. That's what I do. We, we say, Lord, I, I, want, I want it to work out my way. He says, don't worry about it, child. I'm in control, I'm in charge, I'll do what I want. You trust me, follow me, let me lead you and let me use you and see what I do. And that's what he's saying to an entire nation of people. And specifically to a group of people that are not in their comfort zone at all, they are in a completely foreign land, struggling with why we're here, knowing why they're there but not wanting to admit it. They're there out of judgment and they're doing all this stuff and when are we going home? 70 years, you're going home. Well, I may not be here in 70 years. Didn't care. You're going home 70 years. That's not fair. Don't we love it when we say that to God? How many of you have ever heard your kids say that's not fair? If you have more than one, that's what happens, right? And if kids have friends, it'll happen if they don't have more. If you have, yeah, that just happens. There's always it's not, the not fair gene. It's always there, right? It's not fair. It's not fair. We do that as a culture all the time. That's one of the sick things about American culture. Sorry, we always scream about fairness. Nowhere in here does it say it's going to be fair. Nowhere. Fairness is not promised. It says he'll make all things right. Okay. Doesn't that mean fair? Not really. It's according to God's judgment, not mine and yours. Not man's standards, but God's standards. His desire is to make things right the way he wants. But he's telling the children of Israel, I'm going to bring you home in time. I will bring you back in my timing, not yours. And I will accomplish it. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. There is a promise in that verse to people in exile to people in despair, to people in frustration, to all of us is a reminder that God has a plan. It may not be the plan that we have. It may not work out in the way that we think. It may not have anything to do with we think, anything we think makes sense, and that's okay. But he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And what he's asking you and I to do today, as he has every day, I think, is to trust him. Trust me on the path that I have for you. Quit trying to do it yourself. Quit trying to make your way. Trust me, says the Lord God of heaven. That's hard. I don't care who you are. That's really, really hard. But you will be so much better off, and so will I, when we learn to do that. Because his ways are higher than your ways and mine. He knows far more about your life and you than you'll ever dream. 
And he knows how your life fits into the great plan that he has for all of creation. And he'll take you as you are with all your little flaws, failures, idiosyncrasies. All, we all got them, right? We could write books. He'll take you as you are and he'll do something in and through the life he's given you that one day he'll unfold to you and show you this is what I did. And you'll be like, your mouth will hit the floor. You will have no idea that he did all those things through you. When you trust him and when you seek him with all your heart, it's pretty simple. And that's the call, not just for you. It's a call for South End. It's a call for all believers. Trusting him on the path that he has for us and then letting him do with us what he wants. Would you pray with me, Father? I thank you for your word. There's a lot more here that I would like to have said, but time is of the essence. But Lord, I know you work in spite of me, probably better than you do through me. And uh, I'm thankful for what you do in each and every one of our lives. And I pray, Father, if there is one here today that has not responded to you in faith, that this would be the day that that individual, man, woman, boy, or girl, responds to you and your call upon their life to enter into a relationship with you that will change their life forever. Father, I'm thankful that you are patient and kind, but I'm also thankful that you are just and you know what you're doing. Use this time in whatever way you desire, Lord. May you be exalted and lifted up through it because it is all about what you want to accomplish. For us, it's in Jesus' name, amen.